Welcome to Homicide the Podcast. I'm Kevin. <laughs> and I'm Brandon. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who are new, Homicide the Podcast is your newest favorite gay true crime podcast that's hosted by us two queerdos who <laughs> really bonded over coffee cocktails and cock, aka roosters. <laughs> <laughs> we do love a good thick and aggressive rooster we sure do right, love Brandon? a good rooster we do we do love that <laughs> so you're so ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome it's a, it's a gay podcast so yeah. we're gonna obviously talk about roosters. roosters um so brandon what can your story today be described as well i titled my story today the story of an accidentally caught killer <laughs> an accidentally <laughs> caught killer yes well accidents are sometimes good right <laughs> occasionally uh, well, mine is uh, can be described as a gay murderer with a taste for more than just a ding-along. Oh. A ding-along? <laughs> um, a ding-a-ling. <laughs> <laughs> like I've never heard of a ding-along. Who says a ding-along? <laughs> you. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> Welcome to my ding-along sing-along. <laughs> that would be the Those perfect musical. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's, don't steal that. <laughs> right. That's copywritten. A ding, along, a ding along sing along. You heard it first today on it's, Homicide the Podcast. It's a bunch yeah. of gay men singing the female lead parts in all major <laughs> musicals. That's really smart. It is, right? Yeah, I really like that. Um, Coming to a theater near you. <laughs> <laughs> ding along sing along. God, that's really good. That that's is actually good. really good. Someone's going to steal it, fuckers. Okay, anyway. Um, today's episode is titled Forget About It. New York City murders. Yes. Yeah. This is like the part two of our New York episode. And we'll have part three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, yeah, probably. and more. Yeah. But because there's is... a lot of like fucked up killers here. Oh my God. I was doing the research and I was like, geez. Yeah. But don't get it twisted and listen to these news outlets like Fox News. There is like New York is a great place. So it is. That's that. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, uh, we do have someone else here with us and we love her. And her name is Hannah. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I feel like I was <laughs> sounding like I was being strangled or something as I said that. <laughs> and Hi. it was like, for those who can't see, which is a lot of you listening on, like not watching us on YouTube, but Anna was like pointing up towards the, oh, my beard is catching the mic again, but, but pointing up towards the microphone. She's like, hello. Okay. Like, We're more appropriately positioned. Positioned, <laughs> yeah. I know. I feel a little bit, I don't know. Oh, my beard. Dun, I need dun. to cut my beard. Um, okay. Anna, how are you? What's new? What's going on? How's I'm life? I'm good. On Friday, I went to something called the Gaia Music Collective. How's, have you guys heard of that? No. What is that? No, but I feel like that sounds familiar. The You've probably seen it on TikTok. It's this guy who put together basically choirs mm. without any audition. You just come and Ooh. you're like in a choir for a night. Oh, how fun. And you don't always actually go and do a real, an actual song. There's yeah. a lot of like improvisation nights where like together you just like riff with each other. <gasps> but this night was Whitney Houston. <gasps> oh, right. How fun. It Why was, was I not there? Right? So fun. Yeah. You guys should definitely do it. It's I want to dance like with somebody. Not, yes. I thought we were going to do, <laughs> um, I just want to dance with somebody, but it was, um, 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 I will always love you. Oh my God, that's so just another good one. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love Brandon. I will always love you. You're welcome. Thank wow. You. Let's um, hope so. Wow, that was poetic. <laughs> that was so poetic. Thank you for existing. <laughs> You're welcome, Kevin. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so that's why do I feel really like fun. we just got into an argument that I have no idea about? <laughs> yeah, like we're just silent and all. I'm like, that. I don't. But it's like, what do I How do I react? The whiplash. <laughs> what, do I, <laughs> what do I do with this? Um, uh, what else is new? That sounds fun. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> great story. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, nothing else. Um, literally nothing, nothing else. Oh, I am still getting podcast guests. <gasps> oh, yeah. Great. I'm getting yeses sometimes and as you should really exciting the <laughs> yes. the gaia music collective what i was just talking about the founder of that's gonna come on my podcast Anna, oh, that's, awesome. yeah. that's incredible I'm very excited i about cannot that. wait for this to launch i know me and too we're definitely gonna plug it on here because why wouldn't we thank but, you yeah i'm excited i'm sure our, you know five listeners would enjoy this yeah <laughs> no. i i hope that there's not a ton of listeners because um it's probably gonna be kind of not great at the beginning you know what i mean no it'll be fantastic we'll see <laughs> i'm crossed i mean 
mean, we're what? What episode is this in? Is this us? episode six? We're episode 16. 16 and we're still not that great. We so have officially... <laughs> what are you um, talking about? You're amazing. Thank you. Yeah. But we're we're now not an infant anymore. We're now a teenager. We are. We have our driver's license at this we, point. We are getting our driver's license You're getting moody. Oh, yes. You're hating your parents. Yeah. Yes. Yep. We are. Very Goodness. agitated. Yes. And everything. Yeah. But also really, really excited for life. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully there's no murder. And I'm I'm still in my mother's belly yes, you with are. my podcast. You have not you come are. out of the vaginal canal. <laughs> no. But you will soon. I'm just so. a fetus. I'm just, a, just fetus. a fetus. I'm just it's, it's like a sound. At I'm least you're a fetus. <laughs> I was going that way. But what was coming out was not that tone, I, so I stopped. No, I heard it. I heard it. <laughs> I love that. Well, I mean, if you were in Alabama, you're when you had the idea you would have been <laughs> yes you would have been oh a, somebody would get no. thrown in jail if they, they boarded would. me right now yeah. yeah so you know that's, there's dark, that. anyway. that's happening <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little bit brandon do you have anything new and exciting in your life mm, do i ever i don't know do you i don't know oh <laughs> all right well on that note <laughs> i know right um <laughs> i feel like we've just been like working Overworking ourselves, which working and avoiding dealing with our emotional turmoil of our lost pet Marty. Who is yeah, here? Sure. She's on the shelf. You well, just can't see her. Her but picture is on the shelf. We don't want her to fall again. I know. <laughs> oh yeah. I think the the last time that we recorded, had we we already gotten her ashes? Did no. We talk about that? Oh, we didn't. Oh man. Oh, interesting. I think we just didn't talk about it. But oh, probably not. Her, we do have Marty back, which is great. We, I mean, she's in Tampa right now, but um, our niece ended up going and getting her from mm. the USPS. Uh, because was we weren't there. USPS? I think it was UPS, was. actually. Yeah. It's really weird to be like, oh, you have my dead dog's ashes yeah, in, in your the mail. back office. In your back office, <laughs> yeah. Um, but our, our niece, Brianna, ended up going and getting her and putting her on our bed with one of her little blankets and toys like wrapped on top her. of the box so that she's like sitting where she would you know, normally left where she would like lay. I know because we're it's not there. cute and a little more. So we have like a weird shrine to Marty right now on our bed in Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be emotional at all going home. On no, it's no. coming Friday to see no. that. Yeah, but Martina is here on the shelf so that Brandon doesn't put her behind the couch again. How is that my fault? She fell on her own and then I tried to fix it yeah. and just ruined well, it. Well, you were the one doing it. So okay, right. That's it's, why it's your fault. Listeners, it's always my fault. Oh my God. Is this what we're going to do today? <laughs> <laughs> there's actually yes. two things for everyone in a relationship there's two things that if brandon and i ever get into any sort of an argument he always does these very this is not true specific things and at this point i say it to joke about it okay uh, but he always goes <laughs> i have to do everything number one which is like partially true and now i forgot the, <laughs> now I forgot the second one what was the second one it doesn't even matter now <laughs> Not true. Like a drop it. Oh God. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about this later. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Forget about it. New York City murders. Yeah. Who goes first today? I think I do. <gasps> I'm excited to hear your story. I oh, know I haven't told you anything about this one. No, you haven't. Which I'm excited about. I'm too. So. I feel like I wrote this one in a different way than normal, mm -hmm. but we'll just see how it goes. We're as experimenting. We go. Yeah, we're it's we're taking a little a little. Where was I going with that? Detour? Yeah, detour. That's a good word. I don't, yeah, I had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> like, with what that. the hell am I saying right now? <laughs> what am I? All yeah. I can think of is I have what I mentioned before we started the podcast, a word that's original in my mouth, and I'm trying to not chew on it because I know that's not going to be so. So Brandon's right. mouth is overly wet. It's right very now. moist. <laughs> what was that? The last guy would have loved you. Very salivating. Like, well, you're not a woman. Oh, the guy, mm. yeah. Um, the saliva well, drinker. I can't remember his name. He was literally oh, my yeah. last. Oh, God. Um, In episode 15. Ahmed. David. No. Yeah, Ahmed. yours was Ahmed. Ahmed. Yep. And he, what? yeah, he would drink the saliva of 70 women. Uh, well, he yeah. wouldn't want my saliva. No. Hmm. So I'm sure somebody would. But. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I had a lot of messages that were people were like, saliva? Leave yeah. us a review if you want to drink Brandon's saliva. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, Please. I know don't. a couple of people that are obsessed with you that would be like, oh, yeah, I would Ew. <laughs> drink Brandon's saliva. I hope nobody you know wants to drink you know my saliva. About. No, and I don't want to even think mm -hmm. about it because mm -hmm. I don't want to think of anybody drinking my saliva. Nasty. Anyway. Uh, okay, Brandon. So, again, this is the story of an accidentally caught killer. Mm. So, on June 28th of 1993, state police were working the graveyard shift um, in on Long Island... Uh, wow, I said that. I already started that Would off. Would you like to try that again? Take two. 
So my story is titled (laughs) The Story of an Accidentally Caught Killer. So on June 28th of 1993, state police were working the graveyard shift in Long Island on the Southern State Highway. While on patrol, they noticed a 1984 Mazda B2000 pickup truck with a black cab driving down the road with no license plate. So obviously they threw on their lights to pull them over. Um, However, the driver had other plans and decided to take off. So for around 20 to 25 minutes, the troopers held a high-speed chase down various roads along um, in uh, around... Oh my lord, I've already... This is just awful already. You're so cute. Anyways, <laughs> the troopers held a high-speed chase down various roads in Long Island. Getting upwards of 90 miles an hour, the chase ended abruptly when the car attempted to make a left turn, lost control, and crashed into a light pole. Well. Mm. Running out of their cars, the police officers quickly grabbed 34-year-old Joel David Rifkin out of the truck and took him into custody. Joel. Yep, never trusted Joel. Joel. Anyways, <laughs> taking a quick glance, they saw something. Um, I'm really fucking this up right now. Brandon, is you have an A plus today. Do I? For no, effort? It's a D minus. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just going to start that part over again. Okay. So they quickly grabbed 34-year-old Joel David Rifkin, <laughs> Rifkin out of the truck and took him into custody. However, as they grabbed him, they couldn't help but smell something funny coming from the bed of the truck. Oh, I thought they were That's gonna... the sentence that like made this whole thing work. Yeah, and I, totally I thought over. you were going to say like a smell from him. And I was like, ew. ew. No, also probably. Awful. It looked like he smelled... Um, anyways, taking a quick glance, they saw something long wrapped in a plastic, wrapped in plastic and bound with rope. Going in for closer inspection, they were shocked at what they just saw. Inside the plastic was the decomposing body of 22-year-old uh, Tiffany Briskini, Briscani. Tiffany. Um, and from here, the police would accidentally solve a case of a man who had sexually assaulted, murdered, and dismembered at least 17 women between 1989 and 1993. You know, we need to someday address this whole world of men and how they abuse women. Oh, 100%. Because it's always sexually assaulting. I know. Anyway. Because they all have issues that they don't deal with. Men. So I'm going to jump into who Joel was. So Joel Joel was born on January 20th, 1959 to two young college students who couldn't really take care of him. So they put him up for adoption. Mm. And catching the eye of Bernard and Janine Rifkin of Long Island, he was quickly adopted at three weeks old. Bernard and Janine were of the upper middle class, and they lived in East Meadow, Long Island. And eventually, they adopted another child named Jan just a few years after they adopted Joel. Jan. Yeah, Jan and Joel. So at home... (laughs) Did they name him Joel when they adopted him? No, I believe his name was... I I have no idea. Oh. That's a great question. I'm sorry. I just thought you knew him. I I mean, we're not besties, but... um, I wouldn't want him to be my best. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) At home, uh, Joel had a great family life. His parents loved him and they gave him everything that he would need. And according to his parents, they had no idea that he had any kind of issues along the way. Mm. So, however, growing up, Joel had a hard time in school. He never really fit in anywhere and he was often bullied as a child for his learning disabilities. Um, He suffered from undiagnosed dyslexia. Same seas. Um spoke with a stutter, um, and he uh, had and he visibly had a hard time following instructions, which just added to the bullying. So I think that this is worth mentioning. This underlying theme that we seem to have in like every episode, or, or yeah, stop bullying people. Yeah, no, people are really shitty, and yeah. and if he was not bullied, this might not his whole story might not have ever. Happened. I mean, maybe, maybe it's he's inherently just like uh, I don't know. Evil, yeah. but well, I'm sure still. there's a little bit of that too yeah. when we get in, but Let's there is bullying. something to be said about yeah. treating, mistreating people and treating them like they are worthless and nothing mm-hmm. that makes people resent other people and then have these ideas of doing harm onto others. I'm sure that there's like studies out there that actually talk about the idea of the, the impact that bullying can have. Oh, for on, sure. I'm sure there are. Or a correlation between serial killers and yeah. bullying. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so, um, it was even known that he would be often, he would often be, um, one of the last ones to line up in lines and, um, and even he would even get to class late to avoid other kids. So he wouldn't be picked on. 
He did try to fit in at times, though. He tried to join the track team, thinking that being part of a team would help. Um, however, the team was just as bad as everybody else. Uh, they would dunk his head in toilet bowls. And I even saw an A&E article, which is the only place that I saw this, but it was A&E. I figured it was a little bit more legit because they did do a like full story on him. And you yeah. can see interviews on of him speaking and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but in this article... Um, it said that there was even an incident where they had stuffed a dead chicken into his mouth, which oh is really God. fucked up. What? Yeah. And then there was another time um, when he wanted to join the yearbook club because he liked taking pictures. Because um, a few sources I saw said that he was super creative and he liked taking mm -hmm. um, any kind of pictures he could. Um, however, when he ended up um, he ended up getting his camera stolen, and then he was excluded from the rap party at the end of the year by the senior girls who were overseeing it because they didn't want him there. So. Joel grew up um, to be a very isolated person, um, and it said that um, in his late teenage years, he developed um, some <laughs> he developed some odd, dark sexual fantasies. Uh, like he would have daydreams of sexually assaulting and stabbing women and strangling sex workers. Oh no! In this case, I feel like the conversation about bullying, like with mm, boys like this. There are just certain boys that have a rancid vibe. Oh, 100. Like, you I know something is wrong with yeah. them. Yeah. And that doesn't make it okay to mistreat people. No. But it's I like, agree. I feel like these girls that like left him out of this party were probably just freaked out oh, by Oh, I'm him. sure they were they freaked out They probably were him. like, ew, yeah. something's deeply like wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. agree. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was at um, this time uh, that he would start to get a little bit more intrigued with sex workers. Um, and he would often drive around Hempstead, Long Island on the lookout. Um, eventually, Joel graduated from East Meadow High School in 1977 um, and jumped around to a couple different colleges in the area. Um, and it's at this time that he was known for skipping class and he would often not show up to any of his part-time jobs, all because um, by the time he started college, by the time he started college, his attraction to sex workers grew um, so much that it kind of overtook him. Yeah. So eventually, due to his poor grades and lack of wanting to be in school, he ended up dropping out of college. And throughout his time, um, he was uh, he was living with his parents, and he would he would go back and forth from living with him to having his own place. Um, but by the time he dropped out, he was living with his parents, um, and he eventually got a job as a landscaper. Mm. So at this point, Joel's urges uh, to hurt someone, which is really terrifying, kept growing. Um, it's even known that Joel started to collect books and press clippings and news article um, uh, uh, clippings from the, the newspaper on ser serial killers who targeted women. Ooh. Yeah, so he was just a creep. Um, by 1987, a few things started to shift in his life. Um, first was that his father uh, died by suicide mm. to end the pain of prostate cancer. That's sad. Um, and then on August 22nd, 1987, Joel ended up getting arrested for soliciting a sex worker after offering an undercover female police officer money for sex. Both of these incidents really only causes dep depression to get even deeper. Yeah. Um, so in 1989, he was uh, ready to take the next step from enjoying the company of sex workers to fulfilling his fantasies. So I have in here that this is the time when a trigger warning should be part of the programming. Um, trigger warning. Because it gets a little bit rough. Um, or kind of the rest bit of it. <laughs> but I tried to keep it to a minimum. It's not too, too crazy. So um, in Either February or March of 1989, I kind of saw two mixed um, times on that. Uh, Joel's mom uh, went on a business trip because at this point it was uh, he was living with just his mom because his father passed away. Um, so she went on a business tri a trip and uh, left Joel on his own at the house. And he thought, what a better time to bring a sex worker over. To his mom's house? Yeah. So he went Joel. out and found 24-year-old Manhattan-based sex worker named Heidi. Uh, the last name is... B-A-L-C-H. Balk. Balk, is that how you say it? No. Um, I'm so bad with names. I mean, um, I, I don't know, but who, I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. Um, who at the time was going by Susie. <sighs> yeah. Bringing her back to his home in Long Island. Um, Wait, um, he found her in Manhattan? Yeah, he would okay. he would go into Manhattan and find sex workers I f and bring them. He yeah, he wouldn't just, always bring them to his what house. What a long trip, right? Like, yeah. That's a long, that's a long trip. Yeah. I feel like if I was a sex worker, I'd be like, no, thank you. Right. Well, 
these, I mean, it oh, was Heidi. a lot of the women that he brought in were sex workers and a lot yeah. of them were addicted to drugs. And so oh, the no. money was just <sighs> something that was really yeah. promising. No. Right. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of these instances where he also helped supply drugs and bought sure. drugs for these no, women. He knew so, what to do to no, convince he did. people to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he brings her back to the home and the next events I saw kind of like were a little bit jumbled. So I'm not sure what happened necessarily first, but I did find one source that kind of gave me a better view of it. So I wrote this first note saying that the next events, events from what I've seen are hard to explain what happened first. However, the events uh, this woman went through were horrifying. Mm. Um, but according to a, f- a few sources, the events were that he brought her home um, and they had sex. And at some point shortly after, uh, Joel decided to bludgeon her over the head. And from what I saw, it was a it was with a Hauser alt- art- artillery shell, which looked, from when I looked it up, it looked like a massive missile or like a very large bullet. So it was like big. It was maybe a couple feet tall and like wide. So it looked like a very just heavy object. Um, Jesus. And I have in here... Um, like a very large bullet, but I'm also gay and I know nothing about guns. So if you're listening and you're judging me on it, I'll allow it because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, in Joel's account, um, he kept hitting her until he got tired. Um, however, Heidi wasn't dead. Um, and there was a struggle. Um, and there was a note that she even bit his fingers before he grabbed her neck and strangled Heidi to death. Heidi. And then this is where he takes his murders too far. So, I mean, he murdered in general. That's already too far. That's but pretty far. Like, he yeah. takes the next step. So um, after a quick nap for a few hours, because he was tired, oh, yeah. uh, Joel grabbed Heidi's body and brought her down to the basement and draped her body over the washer and dryer to make a makeshift operating operating table. From here, it's known that Joel started to dismember her body using an X-Acto knife. And if you know what an X-Acto <gasps> knife, it's what? a tiny little knife. Yeah. That's so disturbing. It's actually yeah. sadistic. Yeah, like it, yeah, he was like performing that. a surgery, like using a, an exacto knife to cut her. Um, and then, oh my so he um, w- also severed her fingertips. Um, it was noted that he pulled out her teeth and that he decapitated her. All oh, right. Yeah. Jesus oh, my. So that's the that's the the brunt of the hardest parts. But there's a little bit more later on. But um, he then put her severed head in a paint can. And he placed her body, um, her body pieces into garbage bags. He then took the head and legs and dumped them in the woods in Hopewell, New Jersey, and took her arms and torso and threw them into the East River. What is it about the East River and the Hudson? Like, I know. People are like, let me just toss the bodies. Yeah, That's like, right. I'm like, I would never get into the Hudson. Like, no. I would never no. do like the jet ski thing. No. <laughs> the There's... same shit when we talked. To... Yeah, I know. Like, I'm, no, like, I'm like, I'm like, no. you know what's in that water? It's yeah. gross. There's a lot of dead people in there. A lot of like, dead no people. Things. So no. his ultimate goal was to obviously make it difficult for people to find out what happened and it worked so seven days later a paint can was found at the hopewell valley golf course near the seventh hole of the course because that's where he dropped it off oh um, inside they found the decomposing head of heidi oh, no. however at the time the police were not able to connect the head with any missing persons and there was no evidence to who committed the crime um, and i'm sure joel got some kick out of it which only made it worse because he didn't get caught that's so fucked up too, because that I think is why a lot of these people will target um, uh, sex workers yep. or, or people they, because they just assume that. Yeah, no, and that's um, part of my. That's I have a note in here at one yeah. point too where I say um, that he he here I'll actually scroll down. He was quoted at one point saying, um, "I killed prostitutes because they had no one. They had no lasting relationships, no family who cared. No one would ever come looking for them. So he purposefully looked mm-hmm. out for people. And this is kind of like the stories that we did last week. They both looked for sex workers because yeah. they just assumed that they didn't have anybody looking for them. Ugh. Which is disturbing and awful. Yeah. So let me get back to my spot. Um. Okay, so taking about a year break, um, Joel started to think of his next fix. So meeting Julie Blackbird in his next search for a sex worker, Joel jumped at the opportunity opportunity to bring her back to his mother's house because oh he was a gem without his own home. But his poor mom, I know, who who's who, yeah, well, her husband's died. Her husband's <laughs> her husband died by suicide, and then now she's just and she all thinks these women that murdered her, in her home. But she also doesn't know what's happening, and she thinks that her son is like this normal guy, right? <sighs> Which is really shitty. Um, so again, this time around, 
Um, his mother happened to not be home and be out of town. So he, again, saw another opportunity. This time they had sex and they fell asleep. So by the next morning, Joel got a little bit panicked and he grabbed a table leg and beat her with it until she was unconscious. He then once again strangled her to death. And just like before, he dismembered her body. This time he changed it up, though. He put the pieces in buckets that he had weighed down with concrete. um, And he threw the buckets into the East River and in a canal in Brooklyn. Um, Shortly after the murder of Julie, uh, Joel decided to start his own landscaping business, which makes sense because he was in landscaping. However, um, Joel had other reasons of liking this career because he was able to purchase as many tools as he would want uh, without anybody questioning him. He was able to have storage units to hold his tools and supplies and no one would wonder why he would need it. Um, And no one would question him if he was driving all over the city to random locations because the service area could be anywhere. Oh, no. Yeah. So from here... Never going to look at landscapers the same. I know, right? Mm -hmm. So from here, his killings didn't stop and only became more frequent and eventually killing 17 women before he was caught. So in my research... I, it's so funny because as I was doing my research, I, I looked at a lot of different sources. And at first, I couldn't find a lot of information on the women that he killed. And I have a note saying I couldn't find all of the information, but here's a few. But I'm pretty sure I found information on almost everybody. Wow. So um, I have them just listed. So I'm just going to go through them. They're not in any particular order. I tried to be in in the timing of it. Um, but there was a lot of sources that jumped around. So yeah, this kind of jumps yeah. around a little bit. So... Um, on May in May of 1991, he met 31-year-old Barbara Jacobs, um, who had sex with Joel and eventually fell asleep in his bed. No. Seeing a pattern, Barbara. Um, seeing this as an opportune time, Joel grabbed the same table leg and bludgeoned Barbara, and eventually strangled her to death. He put her body in a plastic bag and forced it into a cardboard box. Um, a few hours. Um, And then a few hours after Joel dumped her body in the Hudson River, her body was found by New York firefighter, New York firefighter, firefighters that were on a training exercise. On September 1st, 1991, Joel met 22-year-old Mary Ellen DeLuca, um, and he uh, brought her to a cheap motel um, and supplied her with drugs, and they eventually had sex. For her murder, he eventually made comments that she told him that she wanted to die okay. um, and that she accepted her own murder. Okay. So deciding to s- dispose her body. Um, yeah. Deciding to... I wanted to say depose for a second. <laughs> <That's> not, <laughs> dispose no. her body. He grabbed um, a steamer trunk, in which is one of those bigger trunks, big wooden old timey kind of trunks. Yeah. He found a cheap one. Yeah. Um, and he put her body in it to take her out of the motel. Uh, so nobody noticed what he that he was bringing a body out of this cheap motel, which is it I not feel like, weird to have a big old trunk going in and out of it. I mean, I just think motels. I mean, you expect to see something weird coming out. I don't of know. It. I'm not into motels. <laughs> no, me neither. And, and it reminds me of Beatty, Nevada. Ooh, yeah. That if you're ever nice. going to Beatty, Nevada, first <laughs> off, don't. But <laughs> don't stay in motels. Okay. So it was gross. And that has no context to any of that. It doesn't. Yeah. We went to, okay, we were on a road trip and we went to go to, where were we going? We flew in we flew to Vegas, Vegas and then we were going through Death Valley to, that's right, to yep, like to uh, Yosemite and Yosemite. all that. <clears throat> yeah. And um, Brandon's mom booked this little motel thing in Beatty, uh, Nevada. And we pulled into the town and I was like, ew. Uh, we pulled up to the motel. It was terrifying. And I was like, no. But we went in anyway. And we well, you and my in, mom went in. Yeah. Palm and I went in. But when we walked into the motel, there was no one in there in the front desk and there was just like a cage in the back, like door cage with like some sheet on top of it too. <laughs> and a phone and it said, ring the phone when you arrive. So we like picked up the phone and we're like, um, hi, we're here to check in. So some teenager, runs but the out. phone rang on oh, the other the side of the right. creepy door. <laughs> <laughs> the phone rang literally on the opposite side and you hear, you could hear somebody through the gated <laughs> security door. Um, they were like, hello. And, <laughs> Yeah, it was really bizarre. So this teenager comes out with no shoes. Barefoot. Just, just horrible. Barefoot, dressed horrible. And, and we're like, oh. I mean, God. he. they walked out of the front door all together. And all I could think is he looks like he'd smell like cat pee. And he did. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he like walks us across the parking lot to this area. He's still barefoot um, and opens up this door and walks into this disgusting dark. Somebody was murdered in that room. Um, and... 
It was. He's walking inside the room with, with his, no shoes no, on, no, shoes no on, socks which on. I barely do in uh. hotels anyway. But um, we got back to there, and I was like, "Sorry, no. Like, I'm not staying here." Um, and so anyway, we ended up getting in a fight with his mother, um, who uh, came out yelling at us because we were like, "Yeah, we're not staying here. Goodbye." And that was that. So, <laughs> beady Nevada. Whoa. I yeah. will never go there again. It so, was gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that note. Yeah. He left the the motel with this big suit, this big wooden suitcase, I guess. Um, and then, um, and he dumped her body in a field um, oh, by a rest stop in Cornwall, New York. Um, and her body was eventually found in October. Cause, and again, she was murdered in September. Um, but her body was so far decomposed, they couldn't identify her until Joel was caught. Hmm. Okay, so also uh, in September of 1991, he met 31-year-old uh, Yun Lee, um, who was a Korean immigrant, who he ended up strangling um, and whose body uh, was uh, was found in the East River in the same steamer trunk that he used to hide Mary's body. Yeah, so he just repurposed it. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. Um, then there was 28-year-old Lorraine Orvito, Orvetto. Um, her body uh, was found jammed in a 55-gallon oil drum in Coney Island Creek. However, this time, Lorraine's body was not found for about six months after mm. her death. Um, it was also stated that after her murder, Joel started to use oil drums for a few more of his victims, and he eventually noted that he used them in at least four of the murders. Oh my God. Then in April 1992, Joel met 25-year-old Isis, Iris, I'm sorry, Iris Sanchez, um, who he strangled and drove to to JFK airport and he left his body beneath a mattress in a vacant lot, which was not found until Joel's arrest in 1993. So her body was underneath this random mattress in this vacant lot for like a year, which is already kind of terrifying to know that there could be just a body laying somewhere that Mm. it's just, that's creepy. Or that a mattress just hangs out in some lot for that long. Right. Yeah. So, Then on May 13th, 1992, the body of 39-year-old Marion Holman was also found um, in Coney Island, in Coney Island Creek. Um, another woman was found in an oil drum in New uh, Newtown Creek in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. This woman, which Joel called uh, woman number six, was strangled while she was performing oral sex on him. Cool. Um, unfortunately, the body has yet to be identified, and I believe there's oh, still sad. two women that have yet to be identified. That's sad. Um, on May 25th, 1992, Joel met 33, 33-year-old Anna Lopez. Anna! Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> um, and he left her body in the woods right off of Interstate 84 in Brewster, New York. Twenty. Um, and then there was 21-year-old Violetta O'Neill. Um, she was another sex worker that Joel brought to his mother's house in Long Island. Uh, just like a few of the others, Joel strangled Violetta, uh, dismembering her body, put her in black plastic bags, and dumped her body in various waterways around the city. Oh, my God. Then there was 39-year-old Mary Catherine Williams, um, which he was a f- he frequently uh, um, sought her out as a sex worker. Um, um, and he noted that they typically had a great time. However, in October of 1992, she fell asleep in his car, and he must have found this as like some kind of like them falling asleep. Yeah, like yeah. he just saw their vulnerability in that place, and then he took advantage mm. of it. Um, and she ended up waking up to him strangling her. Um, her body was eventually found um, on December 21st in Yorktown, which is a subdivision in Westchester. Um, on November 16th, 1992, Joel. Um, <laughs> I don't like how I worded this one, but snapped the neck of Jenny Soto, who uh, uh, reports mentioned how she must have been a fighter because of the way her fingernails were broken, oh. um, appearing to have fought back. Oh. Then around February 1993, Joe killed um, Leah Evans and uh, left her body in North Hamptons. Um, and then 28-year-old Lauren uh, Marquez uh, was picked up by Joel on April 2nd of 1993 while she was working on 2nd Avenue in Manhattan, um, who almost got away uh, when she was being strangled because Joel was distracted by somebody walking by. Um, as she fought back, Joel again snapped her neck Jesus. and dumped her body in the Long Island Central Pine Barrens. 
Now, through this time, the police never could really identify who the murderer was because every time it was different and there was no patterns. Yeah. And uh, there were many unsure if it was by the same person or different people. I um, mean, some people didn't get caught or didn't get found until after he um, was caught. So um, this kind of like caused a storm in the community. Um, and so this is where I jump back to the beginning of the story. Uh, so again, on June in June of 1993, Joel met Tiffany Briscani. Um, who was working the streets. Uh, she was working on Allen Street in Manhattan. Um, and just a little bit about her. She had dreams of moving to the big city uh, to become an actress on Broadway. Um, Tiffany's dreams were stripped from her when she got into the wrong crowd. Um, and she started to abuse drugs and hard drugs like heroin. Um, and then eventually became a stripper at various New York uh, strip clubs. And then she met, uh, eventually met her boyfriend and pimp, Dave Rubenstein. Um, who she was with the night that Joel picked her up, telling Dave that she would be back in about 20 minutes. They said goodbye, and Joel and Tiffany uh, went on their way. However, she would never end up coming back. So shortly after Joel picked picked her up, she dro- they drove to the New York Post parking lot at 210 South Street, which is on the, the north side of the Manhattan Bridge. Mm. And it's here where Joel strangled Tiffany and then drove home to his mother ho- mother's house with the body in the trunk. By the time he got to his mother's house, it was the early hours of the morning and his mother was eager to leave to run some errands. And now what I didn't mention is that with this murder and a couple of the other murderers, he was using his mom's car. Oh my God. So Uh. he got home. She grabbed the keys and headed on her way to run some errands. Um, Luckily for Joel, she did not open up the trunk and she never knew the body was inside the entire time she was gone. Oh. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. You're as you're talking about her mother, his mother. Before I'm like, just wait till we get to that oh, point. Jesus. Um, so by the time she got home, Joel went in. Um, uh, Joel went and wrapped uh, the body in tarp and put her body in a wheelbarrow, um, and he let her sit in the summer heat of their garage for three days before anything happened. Okay. How did the mom not smell that? Yeah. I don't know. That was one of my questions too. Actually, I might answer it in a little bit. So give me. A little bit, and I might have an answer for you. Okay. So then when Joel went to dispose of the body, about 15 miles north of his home, is when the state troopers noticed his missing license plate. So oh. quickly after Wait, they... This is still his mom's car, though, right? So no, they this oh. was back into his truck. So he did the high-speed chase in his truck in the bottom. Oh, that's the right. We're truck. back at the chase. Yep, so okay, we're back yeah, at yeah. the beginning. Okay. So quickly, the police ended up bringing Joel in for questioning since they found the body of a woman in the bed of his truck. Mm. Um, luckily for the police, um, I saw a couple different things where at first he didn't admit to anything, but then I also saw other ones that said that Joel was open about everything. But what I do know is that eventually he described all 17 murders, named all of them that he could, and then sketched out on maps uh, where he disposed of the victims that have yet to be found. Jesus. So in their investigations, the police found dozens of ID cards, ID cards, driver's licenses, credit cards, photographs, jewelry, and piles of clothing um, from his victims in his home. They also found a wheelbarrow. Barrel? That's such a weird word. A wheelbarrow wheelbarrow mm-hmm. um, and a chainsaw stained with blood. No. And this is where I was saying I was might get to that point. Neighbors came out and talked about how they often smelled a foul smell coming from their home, but they all assumed it was from the fertilizer of his landscaping business. So I could only imagine his mother might have thought that the smells were coming from something having to do with the landscaping business. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, With Joel's admission, he obviously was found guilty, and he was eventually sent... This is... an aggressive ambulance. I know, right? (laughs) And... And it's it's like the perfect timing, because I'm talking about him getting... Well... Convicted. Yeah, so they're basically... (laughs) This this was the experience when they arrived at the house. All right, Yeah, that's awful. Um, Anyways, he was obviously found guilty and was eventually sentenced to 203 years in prison. Um, And I saw that he only got convicted of nine of the 17 murders. So at first he was sentenced to uh, the Attica Correctional Facility, where he Mm -hmm. ended up having some conflicts with other inmates, causing him to be a bit disruptive. Um, One that was noted um, was that he got into an altercation with another mass murderer named Colin Ferguson, who was in prison for the 1993 Long Island Railroad mass shooting that killed six people. So thinking that this could escalate um, and 
uh, would cause issues for everybody in the prison. Prison officials uh, ended up placing Joel in solitary confinement for 23 hours of the day for about four years. Great. Oh my right? God. Um, <laughs> In in 2000, Joel attempted to sue the prison for this treatment, and I have <laughs> and I have a note what? that says, "Cause boo hoo for you, like oh yeah. you God. killed 17 people. I don't give a fuck. And do you think that you have if anything you're in to stand on? For, okay. And he actually like wanted money for it too. Oh my God. Yeah, which I didn't put in here, but it was just like a. <sighs> this is what starts to like to annoy me that these people you just killed 17 people and you are. Upset about how somebody's treating you? Go yeah. fuck yourself, yeah. right? I no, I actually think that that, like the conversation last time about the death penalty, I actually yeah. think that that is the treatment that every I like mass agree. murderer yeah. should get. I you agree. should get solitary yeah. confinement, yes. yeah. but you should have to live. Yes, yeah. you by should yourself. be. You should be stuck in a room, yeah. not and being able to be leave yeah. or talk to other people because you don't deserve to be around other yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. Right. I always envision um, solitary confinement too. Did you guys ever watch the show Oz? No, no. It, it was it was when we were younger. But it's with what's his name who's super hot, right? Oh God! Well, there's a lot of them that are hot in there. Oh 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 oh, Chris. Oh shit, Murat. No shit, he's in an SUV or whatever. Yeah, whatever his name is, he's so he's virgin and he's naked in it. <laughs> but as a young gay boy, I was like, oh my God, there's dicks in this show. Um, but they when they put them into solitary confinement, well, it's, not, were, it's not even just you as a little boy. You right now would be like, oh, there's dicks in this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love dicks for sure. Like we said, but, you love ro- roosters. <laughs> roosters. I, we were literally walking today, and I was like, Brandon, I love naked men. <laughs> I did. And I was like, Why did okay. you just say that? I'm like, I, I was, know you do it. And I was like, I'm just trying to have conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. It was. Um, but anyway, no. But the show Oz, when they were put into solitary confinement, they were stripped. They were naked. They were thrown into like this pen um, uh, in the dark with like a spotlight and like no food. It was fucked. <laughs> And like, I think they even had to like go to the bathroom. There was no toilet in there. Ooh. And I was like, whoa. So when I envision solitary confinement, yeah. that is what I envision. Yeah. I envision yeah. the um, Orange is the New Black scenes. Mm. Did you guys ever watch that? Uh, you loved a that. A little yeah. bit, yeah. yeah. There were a couple me. of solitary yeah. confinement oh, episodes. Were there? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't yeah. imagine it. I think it would be a psychological torture. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And there's no reason I'll ever put myself in that place to be in there. No. But so, you're not, you're not mm-hmm. making decisions to murder yeah. people. I mean, no. Yeah. So um, when, when Joel decided to sue pres- the prison, he said that they were vi- violating his constitutional rights. Okay. However, the uh, courts ruled in the prison's favor. Um, however, he was still eventually transferred to a different correctional facility, which was Clinton Directional Facility in Danamora. I've never heard of this town before. Dan, I think it's Dane Mora. Dane Mora. D-A-N-N-E-M-O-R-A. Um, in wrong. New York, um, where he is not in solitary confinement currently. Is the motherfucker still alive? I mean, I'm assuming he is. Oh. So in 2002, Joel tried to appeal the convictions of the murder of the nine women. Um, however, the Supreme Court of New York rejected it. So Joel will be eligible for parole in 2197 at the ripe age of 238. So here's my question. <laughs> he tried to appeal the convictions of murders that he admitted to and showed them where the bodies were. Yes. However, okay, and I probably should have noted this. Hmm. and Maybe I probably should have taken this part out. Because I couldn't tell if it was for the nine murders of the women he already did. Because the note I, I saw, I saw this a couple times. It said nine. However, I also got the the feeling that he was trying to appeal the convictions of the other women that he killed. Because he was not convicted for all of the killings yet. Got it. So I wasn't sure if it was for the that nine women or the eight women that he did not I wonder, get convicted of. I wonder when that happens. Because this happens often where they're like, well, we convicted of them of the two of the 15 murders. And they're, I wonder if they don't pursue it because of the cost to um, the county states. I mean, they whatever. could. I'm not, yeah. But I'm, that sucks for the, the people that are murdered and their families because the conviction, conviction for sure. is not At there. At least in this in this instance, he basically told them that he did kill all of these people. So I don't know why he wasn't convicted of all of them in the first place. Again, it might be that. It might be it like, be. it's too costly to have it trials be. for all these. Yeah. Because at this point, they're like, he's already going to be in prison for over 200. Like, he's not going to live to 200. But it's also like, why doesn't the state do um, the state against all 17 in one trial? Or is that just like too bulky? I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll have a, uh, someone. Yeah. Come on and speak to that. Can we have a judge, please? Right. Do we know a judge of the state of New York? Prosecutor. I mean, and my sure mom deals with prisoner complaints. 
as a lawyer, <gasps> but she's not allowed to like oh. come on well, media and talk about things. That's right. Well, poop. So poop. Hi, mom, though. <laughs> well, all right. I was going to say, maybe we can have like, who's the attorney general? Is it Letitia? Letitia? Oh, yeah. Is it Letitia? <laughs> yes. Because she's the one that Letitia James brought right? charges on Trump. Yeah. Yeah. I love her. Um, I'm sure she can't also talk. So maybe that. we could do an episode where it's like those uh, TV shows where they have like the the screen is like black and they they yeah. like alter yeah. their voice the so they're voice. like yeah. talking like this. Or something. <laughs> it's really creepy. I know like, you're welcome. Out. All right, I make good radio, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I just have some okay. interesting facts. One is what I already said, which was um, the quote where he talked about killing prostitutes. Sex workers. I tried to switch it in my own well, he, vernacular, but, he, but that's he, what he said. Yeah, his yeah. quote is as quote as I said. Um, yeah. And to all of the sources out there that I read, do better and fix your words and don't use that. Like it's really easy to change that to sex workers. I agree. Not just in his quotes. Like obviously his quotes is one thing, but in all of the research I read, they only consider them that one thing. And it's like, come on, it's 2023. I think uh, we can fix that. It's 2024. Um, it's 2024. <laughs> it is totally 2024. Uh, it's March. I do think that they, uh, I think that being sex workers, that's more the last 10 years, isn't it? Or maybe even the last five. Yeah. But some of the articles I was reading were mm, not shitty. old. Yeah. Anyways. Even if, even if that they like, yeah, we should update it. But yeah. Anyway. Anyways. Um, so the first victim who we know, who we know now as Heidi went by many different names and social security numbers at the time because she was trying to hide herself, yeah. um, that they couldn't actually identify her who she was. So he, she was one of the un, um, identified bodies. Okay. However, in 2013, um, they were able to do a DNA, DNA test using the DNA from her mother and her father to confirm it was her. So, uh, she was killed in what? I heard 1992 yeah. or 1991. Or maybe even earlier. I don't even remember the, the 90s, date at this point. Yeah, <laughs> um, the early 90s. Yeah, so she, um, yeah, so she wasn't confirmed uh, until 2013 that it was her. Wow. Um, two weeks after the death of Tiffany, David Rubenstein, like I said, her her boyfriend and pimp, died by suicide by overdose, and it is said it's due to the guilt of her death, which I is mean, super sad because from what I read, it like they actually had a they actually were in a relationship. Um, no, but then it was you know, but then you think about it, and you're like, you were her pimp, you were pimping, pimping out yeah. your girlfriend for sex work. That honestly, I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't know a lot of or any sex workers, but um, I feel that it's not something like there. You said something in here about like they would have a great time, and I'm like, yeah, he it's, would have well, a great exactly, time. exactly. He I don't would. know, I just don't. But that know was that. him saying we would have a great time. That was yeah. like his own account. I'm sure that there are people that that enjoy sex work, which is great. Um, but I, I I have a feeling like a lot of times it's it's work. It's not. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Do you see what I'm the, saying? Her job saying? is great. to make you feel like it's a great time. Yeah. So yeah, you had a good. Time. So you she had a good time. Exactly. Not. So, but I, but it's it's difficult to know like that. This he, is so he's aggressive. aggressive. <laughs> Sirens today, yeah. Right? Can y'all stop murdering people out there? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Jesus. Pause for a second. Pause for the alarm. <laughs> We're doing our podcast. Thank you. Jeez. Um, no, but I, it's, it's just, it's, it's rough to like hear, like he died by suicide because of the guilt from, yeah. but like he was actively pimping her out. I know. So it's, so it's just like, like a, a, a double hard... edge kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. So the last note I have in here is in an interview with a &E, um, Joel commented that some of his victims couldn't satisfy him or please him. And a few ridiculed him, which caused him to make the decision to kill them. Okay, Joel. Yeah. So fuck you, Joel. If you're alive, you're a shit bag. So Wait, that's guys. Somebody was literally murdered in my apartment a couple years ago. I'm sorry. Like not in my, the one you're not, living in? No, not oh, the current in the building. one. But the the apartment that I was living in, like at that time. You're like the real life version of only murders in the building. Right. Yeah. This is interesting. Totally. Can you tell us for a second? What yeah. Happened? So I was living in this apartment in the financial district, like a luxury apartment. Like it was nice yeah. because we got it for COVID pricing. So Love. slay. Love. <laughs> um, but me and my boyfriend were out of town. We were in Texas, like visiting my family. Mm -hmm. And then our roommates texted us the article about it. Apparently there were two men that were seen rolling an oil drum out fuck? of the apartment. That's so creepy. And the doormen were like, 
What are you doing? What's that? Like they questioned them about it because yeah. they were like, that's fucking that's weird. Strange. Why do you have an oil bin in this luxury apartment yes, in the financial what district? What are you doing? And they were just like, oh, we're moving. And they were like, okay. No. no. Who like, an oil drum? I mean, no, exactly. And um, I mean, the doormen weren't going to be like, well, open your oil drum. <laughs> <I know>. right? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, if that was me, I'd be like, yeah, go with yeah, it. They I don't need to see what's like, in your okay, oil okay, drum. But we'll I would like call the cops and be like, suspicion. Yeah. Well, yeah. so... Um, I don't know how exactly they connected the dots. I think it was something like the phone bills or I, I don't know. But the oil drum was found in New Jersey, suburban New Jersey, like in a random neighborhood. What? Not a bad neighborhood either. Yeah. Just a random neighborhood yeah. that they like Just dropped, dropped this oil drum at. So they found the body and then the search went out for like oil drum. You know, like I don't know exactly how they... Yeah traced it back to our apartment but the doormen were like oh yeah we did see somebody roll an oil drum out of here and then they went back saw it on the cameras <sighs> and then traced it back to people in my apartment not my not literally my apartment yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and it was my roommates and they're murderers <laughs> no but that, like oh not my on my floor or anything but i think it was like an airbnb yeah and there were like a couple of people that it was a sex worker no, and it's so yeah, fucked up. It was a sex worker, and those people, I think, just like rented the Airbnb for a night, killed this woman. And I don't, we never really got like information about, about yeah. like what happened. Yeah. But yeah, like what I, and fuck? I think she was in the apartment for a couple days before they took her out. Like, I mean, I'm sure that they were like, well, great. Now we need to get an oil drum. Right. And where do you even find an <laughs> like oil just, drum? Like, yeah. Where do you, where do, I don't, like, no I would idea. never, I wouldn't, my mind Especially would never. Especially as an Airbnb guest. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? So weird. I, so, so weird. Uh, but also, like, do they have to disclose that on the Airbnb? <laughs> I Welcome mean, I home. feel like Somebody at that point, you here. would have to just sell your Airbnb. Like, I don't even know. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. That's no. fucked. Yeah. yeah. Anna coming in hot with Well, that we were very note. disturbed by it for I a while. Yes. <laughs> we were like, uh, maybe we need I would, to get yeah. out of 100%. this. 100%. percent maybe move? Yeah. Yeah, no thank you. Wow. Well, Jesus. All right. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Just that, dropped that. Wow. Right. Just this whole story, the whole time I've been like, whoa, this is kind of reminding me of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's. I mean, yeah. oil drums, sex, the oil drums, yeah. sex, yeah. sex worker, worker like, murder, yeah. New York, dropping them off, dropping in random them off places. in random places. Yeah. Yeah. There, did you guys see the oil drums? I'm not sure why it reminds me of this. Uh, some forensic files for sure, but there was a movie, Cloverfield Three, or yeah. Cloverfield Two, I think, with John I saw Goodman. That. Yes. Right. It was the and, second one, and I it's think. like in a bunker when it happens or whatever. Because yeah. the same thing that happens in New York and Cloverfield is, is happening still, but it's in like a places. different sub story or whatever. Um, but they're like in the bunker, and he had killed people but dissolved them in oil mm -hmm. drums of acid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the guy that was with them that he had killed, he was like putting his body in there or whatever. When she, yeah, like see, yeah. Ugh. Which there's like a lot of stories of oil drum and acid. Yeah, if, if you I see an oil drum, run. I'm not going to. Get I'm away. just going to question everything. If you know somebody with an oil drum that shouldn't have one, <laughs> maybe just call the police. Yeah. Or I'm don't just, ask questions. I'm not ever going to talk to you again. Yeah. 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 Ew. I don't. My story does not have oil drums, you guys. Good. So. Well, are you ready to? Yeah. Dive I'm, in. I'm a little gooped and gagged by both of your stories. <laughs> You're welcome. <sighs> and this one's going to be rough. I oh know because I heard you doing this one and. For those who don't know Kevin, he can be very like vocal when he's reading stuff and be like, oh, what? I think you can just <laughs> and say. And he's writing it. And I'm like, what are you, what is this? I would just say that I can be vocal full stop. Yeah. Yeah. Just you're loud. Yeah. I think a lot of Kevins are. I'm not loud. Loud and proud. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, yes, I'm ready to dive into my episode. Well, this is the full episode, um, but my actual <laughs> your one. story, yeah, which I don't know that I named. You, well, you gave us like the little tease in the beginning. What was that? I did. My little tease was a gay murderer with a taste for uh, more than a dingalong. Oh, that's right. You said dingalong. Is what I said. Dingalong, yeah. sing along. He wants more than a dingalong. He wants a sing along. <laughs> he wants a 
<laughs> That's a ding along sing along. That's what my title is, is ding along sing along. So Perfect. Welcome to my Now if there's no singing in this, I'm gonna be very upset. It was the early morning hours. No, I'm just you have to sing the whole story. <laughs> Could you I love imagine? It. Oh my god. All right, we can dive in. Are we ready? <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Um okay. <laughs> Are oh. we ready? Y'all ready for this? Okay, have the rights. Um, no, we don't. But <laughs> we only did, we only did 0.5 seconds, we so did. we're fine. Um, okay, I'm so excited for this. So my title today is Ding Along, Ding Along, Sing Along, Ding Along, Sing Along. It's just a Ding Along. It's Ding Along, Sing Along. Um, starring. Just kidding. Uh, okay, so it was the early morning hours of September 14th, 1997. When Addison Verrill, a gay reporter at Variety, who covered the film industry, entered into a New York City Christopher Street bar named Badlands. Is that still around? I don't think so. I I don't think I've heard of that one. Yeah. Um, Addison quickly noticed a man and offered him a beer. After conversation and a few drinks, both began to party, consuming poppers, cocaine, and more alcohol. As one does. As one does. (laughs) After, I mean, I've never done poppers or cocaine. I haven't either. (laughs) But... (laughs) Some do. Um, No judgment. After moving to another bar, which happened to be a gay BDSM bar Mm. called Mineshaft. Of course it was called Mineshaft. (laughs) Yep. The two decided to take things a bit further and hopped into a cab. Did you just fart? No, it was my hand on the couch. (laughs) (laughs) It was like, excuse me. (laughs) Right? Like... Like, I would uh, not hold that. I mean, I don't know. Okay. Mid story. You know, sometimes when you like move and you're like, oh shit. And you don't mean to fart, but it like I'm, just kind of comes out. Like yeah. your butthole slips a little bit. And yeah. Some are wider than, wider than others. Buttholes? Wider. <laughs> what? What? I don't know. I just said that. Okay. Back to my. You know shaft. when you say something and you're like, why the fuck did I just say that? It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. Like right now? Anyways, um, we all fart. All right. We do. I just haven't yet. In this podcast recording it. Well, that's nice. Um, okay. So <laughs> back to our BDSM bar called Mineshaft. Um, the two decided to take things a bit further and hopped into a cab heading to Addison's New York City studio apartment, which was on Horatio Street. And if you don't know where Horatio Street is, it's in the West. Well, it's in Greenwich Village. Um, it's a gorgeous street, by yeah, the way. I it's one of those cobblestone there. streets. Yeah. Um, once Brown there... Town. The two of them kept drinking and consuming drugs, and finally, which they headed there about 6 a.m., which is like, I don't don't know how people do Wait, how old were they? Right. Um, In their 20s. I mean, yeah, in my 20s, I definitely would have done that. Now? I think that that Addison was older. I think he was in his 40s. Oh, my God. Yeah. So anyway, um, 6 a.m., they head over to Addison's apartment, uh, kept drinking and consuming drugs, and then finally around 7.30 a.m., the two finally get saucy and have some sex. So, afterwards, things turned quite south. They turned south quite quickly. So, what Addison didn't know was that this would be his last night alive. Uh, so, Addison. the man he brought home would be his murderer. See, that's terrifying. So, this is the story of suspected serial killer... Paul Bateson, who ironically appeared in the 1973 horror film The Exorcist. What? Like dun, dun, dun. as an actor in it? Yes. Oh, ew. So oh. I know. You so, know what? I actually saw this one in my research and I almost did this one. So I'm glad you did because I didn't read the whole thing, but I read that part. Well, I read the whole thing and it's fucked. So, okay. Let's talk about Paul Bateson real quick for, for just a second. There's, oh, I mean, there's Paul some in, information on him, but he's basically a, a tool bag. So he was born on August 2nd of 1940. He grew up in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and he was the son of a metallurgist. Have you guys ever heard of that? No. What? So metallurgists, no, metal, met, mm, metallurgists <laughs> are <laughs> um, material scientists who specialize in metals such as steel, aluminum, iron, and copper. So basically they study how metals can be safely transformed into products to benefit humanity. That's really interesting. Which I find to be like really interesting. So what's interesting about... Seems way too smart for me. (laughs) I'm like, no, thank you. Um, Apparently um, his dad, so um, the metallurgist, metallurgist, whatever. Uh, Apparently his dad... Why do you keep trying to say that word? Because I can't get it and it bothers me when I can't get something. So anyway, his dad uh, apparently would make him stay home 
um, from Saturday matinees uh, at the local movie theater um, and instead would make him listen to opera on the radio. I thought it was the that's, weirdest. That's so weird. That already fit. That feels like somebody is grooming them to be a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> or like maybe he lied about it. I don't know. Yeah. It was a weird thing. But there's nothing else really about his childhood or bullying. Nothing. But he um, ended up serving. It's like I'm killing people yeah. because I had to listen to so just, much opera. It's the opera meal song. Is he the phantom <laughs> of the opera? <laughs> He's literally the phantom <laughs> of the opera. <laughs> Holy shit. Um Anyway, he ended up serving in the army in the early 1960s where he began drinking heavily out of boredom, which I think is really interesting. Um, but he ended up being stationed in Germany, which is where um, his lifelong struggle, lifelong struggle with alcohol, is, I cannot talk, alcoholism began. So he was discharged from the army and returned to Lansdale and actually stopped drinking at that time. So by 1964, he ended up moving to New York City where he began a relationship with a man who was involved in music, which... Also, okay. So um, he actually described himself as not exclusively gay. Hmm. I wonder if that was like a, the during the time thing being like that the seventies was... that you were like, yeah. I'm not exclusively where you were hiding gay. a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know, maybe because um, this is all pre AIDS epidemic. Yeah, like the gay world was a lot different even yeah. before then. Um, so his mother ended up dying of a stroke and his brother actually died by suicide. There are some weird parallels, by the way. Um, there always are. I know. So he, uh, eventually trained as a neurological radiological technician and began working in that field, which I find to be incredibly interesting, which does tie back into why he was in the exorcist. So his relationship actually ended up ending in 1973 and he moved into Borough Park, uh, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn. It's part of downtown so Brooklyn. Brandon and I actually used to live. Like right the Borough Park. Um, and so I thought that was interesting. But uh, he commuted from Brooklyn, which is literally one stop, um, into the city. But uh, he commuted from Brooklyn into the city where he worked at New York University Medical Center. Um, he was really well liked. And his, re- his colleagues respected the shit out of him, um, which... I think is really interesting too because I've heard this kind of stuff before with some murderers where yeah. people are unaware of that and they're it's like, because they're, they're like it's like they have their two different lives they have their yeah. life where they uh, want people to think that they there's nothing wrong with them mm-hmm. and then they have like their back CD life where they're like killing people which yeah, is so interesting it's like the difference between I mean I don't I have no idea if this is actually medically or psychologically accurate yeah. but like the difference between a uh, narcissistic psychopath Mm. and just a psychopath because a psychopath might have a harder time like covering it up where a narcissist can have the the charm yeah and the manipulation and the manipulation and the like social climbing skills that just a straight up psychopath doesn't (sighs) have yeah so scary right um so he actually worked as a radiological technologist like he that that was who that's what he did for work so because of that that is why he appeared in a scene from the 1973 horror film, The Exorcist, which, by the way, was inspired because um, the film's director, William Friedkin, uh, who had watched... Um, uh, so the story is that um, William actually went to the hospital that Paul was working at um, to uh, actually view this um, team perform this cerebral angiogra- angiography. Angi- angiography. <laughs> yep. Here's another one. <laughs> um, uh, so he actually went to go like see this team perform this surgical thing because he was oh, that was the media card because he was going to put this into the film um, and so at the time these procedures were performed by puncturing the patient the, the patient <laughs> <laughs> ah, the patient what is happening uh, um, anyway by performing performed by puncturing the patient's what is this word carotid Car- carotid carotid I, I kept saying carotid or car carotid uh, whatever <laughs> carotid artery in the front of the neck in order to insert a catheter through which um, a contrast agent was injected in order to make the patient's blood vessels more visible under x-rays so um when they did that though the puncture um blood would like spurt out in general um uh, at the rhythm of a patient's heartbeat right because it's it's literally your carotid artery yeah. which is like your main so um the director was sufficiently impressed. Oh, of course. Um, I mean, why wouldn't for he For a horror film. <laughs> that he wanted the team to perform the procedure on camera. 
So was it a real procedure that they had on camera? Not a real procedure that they had on camera. They mimicked the procedure. But they got the surgical team, which included Paul, that's so crazy, to go onto the film to perform it well, to make it look film. real. Yeah, I mean that's, that's so weird. It's yeah. so weird, but like from a, a cinematography standpoint, that's it's really genius. interesting. It's yeah. actually like, genius. Let's get in somebody who actually knows what the fuck they're doing yeah. to do this. Yeah. So, Unless they're a murderer. <laughs> yeah. Which it gets interesting. So this specific scene, which has a lot of blood on screen. If you haven't seen um, this particular movie, it is the scene when she's like wheeled into the hospital mm-hmm. and they're doing the the whole, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of blood. So it's actually considered one of the film's most disturbing scenes. And many medical professionals at the time praised it for its realism. Which makes sense because he literally yeah. got this team to go do it. Which again... For the director, that's really smart. I know. Um, but I he had no idea who no. he was picking. <laughs> and we'll talk about that director again. But, but realistically, anybody who's hiring somebody to be on a film, you don't know who they are. They could easily have murdered yeah, people sure. or go on to murder he people. He had not murdered anybody by that time. As of well, you know, hmm, that we know of. Maybe. So uh, in the scene, it's actually Paul who speaks most of the dialogue. So he had, um, in general, a calming bedside manner at work. And he had that in the film, too. So you can actually, um, he can actually be seen in the background early throughout, throughout the scenes when she's like being wheeled in. And then you can also hear his voice off camera instructing her and warning her that the um, uh, puncture would, uh, would hurt. But he was like reassuring her the whole time. It's so weird. This makes yeah, me want to watch the movie. Man. I know. So I want to talk about The Exorcist a little bit because this is a incredible film that has a lot of weird shit tied to it. Yeah. Because I've heard of- a lot of the cast thinks that it's cursed yeah. in general. So, Like the poltergeist? Uh, it's similar. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, sometimes you just don't fuck with stuff. But uh, the interesting thing about this production is that it was plagued by like really strange and sinister things from the beginning. And so I pulled this information from an article that was written based off of the documentary called The Fear of God, 25 Years of the Exorcist. So in that, um, the very first thing that happened was a fire broke out on the set of the McNeil home, which is the main family's yeah. home, um, uh, the where the exorcism was. So like, like that was like the most of the film was like her in her bedroom. And yeah, the, yeah. So um, it claimed the whole set except for one room, which was the bedroom where the girl was possessed. So it took six oh, that's weeks. Creepy. I know it took six weeks to rebuild the set which I was interesting. So in the first week of filming, Max von um, Sido, I think that might be how you say his name, um, who actually played the father uh, in it, learned that his brother had died delaying production. And then right after, about the same time, but a little bit after, Linda Blair, who is who played the, the main character, the little girl, um, Regan, she lost her grandfather, which caused another delay to production. Uh, so we had two deaths. That's weird. So... From there, there was a 10-foot demon statue that was supposed to be used in the film um, (laughs) that was lost in Hong Kong en route to the filming location in Iraq. How do you lose a (laughs) 10-foot demon (laughs) statue? Where did it go? I I don't know. Oopsies. Um, But they filmed like the archaeological (laughs) dig site in Iraq. I so love you fucking up so much. Thank you. I know. It's usually you. I know. Um, But anyway, it was was lost in, in route to um, the filming location in Iraq. And then um, Ellen uh, Burstyn, who played Linda Blair's mom, um, said nine people died during the production, including an assistant cameraman's newborn baby (gasps) and a night watchman. How did they all die? I don't know. Another death was um, actor Jack McGowan, who died shortly after appearing in the film. He died of complications from the flu. Um, and then others on set suffered lifelong injuries, including a crew member who lost his toe and a carpenter who chopped off his thumb. Oh my God. And then, um, also Linda Blair, again, who played the little girl, um, Reagan shared that she fractured her lower back while convulsing in a harness. So oh my we gosh. watched the film and she's like convulsing in the air. She's in a harness and she remembers screaming, please make it stop. It hurts. It burns. But her dialogue mirrored the script so much that no one knew to stop the scene. Oh, oh my no. gosh. That's the footage that was used in the film. <gasps> oh my gosh. That's awful. I know. I mean, that's some raw <laughs> acting though. Yeah. It They're doesn't like, get any more it. real than bitch. That, that. was real. Um, <sighs> so the, the fire. Uh, so anyway, they actually, they were, there was so much happening that they were like, we need to bless 
this actual, like we need to bless this production. So they brought somebody in to bless the entire set due to the fire and other strange occurrences. They're like, throughout. actually, all of you need a real exorcism. Right. <laughs> There's like people walking with sage burning. <laughs> Goodness. Goodness um, gracious. <laughs> and crosses everywhere. Splashing um, holy water everywhere. Jesus. So... Uh, the premiere happens in 1973. That's when the film comes out. And um, after the premiere, now we're back to Paul. Paul started drinking again. So he was in the film. Um, the premiere happens. You know, the, the film opens up to, I mean, it was a big film. Um, and so he started drinking again, which eventually impacted his performance at work. So he ended up getting fired from his job in 1975, um, which is awful. So... He got odd jobs uh, performing light repair work, cleaning apartments, and taking tickets at theaters that would show pornographic films. So um, he ended up going to AA, which helped him stay sober for a while, but he, of course he eventually fell off again. And um, by 1997, Paul was drinking heavily, and he started to visit leather bars mm. in the leather West Village so and Greenwich Village. I know. We've only been to one. Yeah. What is a leather bar? It's... <sighs> It's like a subculture of the gay yeah, community. It's like that. I don't know that I can describe it. I would say they don't fet- totally know. I would say it's more kind of like it's a like fetish. a fetish, but you they, dress in like leather, but it's like leather chaps where your butt's exposed. Oh and like, yeah, yeah. Like we went, we went to one place, and it was funny because yeah. it was me, Kevin, and to this other man that I mentioned on the podcast at one point. We went with him. Yes, we went with him. Oh, I don't remember that. Like I said, his name is Tommy. He's a jackass. Um, <laughs> Tommy, if you're listening, um, we all, <laughs> I know, you right? suck. <laughs> he probably is too, because he's that kind of person. He's kind of weird. Um, but we like walked in in our like polos and like whatever. We, Do you remember that? We should not have been. We there. walked in because we we're like, let's go. We've never been and let's experience whatever. And we walked in and we were the only ones not wearing leather, but they were like men in leather police officer outfits with their asses <laughs> hanging out Slay. and. Uh, yeah. Like leather jock straps and uh, firefighter costumes and all of these I different. Even remember, I remember somebody getting a blowjob in the corner, and I was like, yeah. "Oh my god, where are we?" Wait, so yeah. do yeah. people like change when they get there, or they like no, go they on go the there. subway? With I'm their sure ass they go out. there. Yeah, I'm they, sure. Like, well, I'm, maybe not. I'm sure it's a little out, bit of both. Mo- maybe a little, a little bit, bit of both. both. But no, you'll like if you. I mean, God, go hang down in Christopher Street. No, it's not even Christopher Street anymore. No, it's, it's kind like, of all over. It's kind of all over New York. But even like point. in 1977, I'm sure people were not riding the trains. No, in their they would have, or they would have changed. Their, changed, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just like, but it's like a, it's, it's, it's like it's a kind lot of a BDSM kind of. Yeah, vibe. a lot of bear, a lot of bears are like Brandon and I are kind of considered bears in the gay community because we're like fatter and hairy. And <laughs> wait, like, wait, wait! This is beards. reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw saw a TikTok that was like talking about twinks and how every twink (laughs) needs a handler and the handler is like a hot woman (laughs) who's like the best friend basically. Oh, a hundred percent. And this guy was talking about how every twink needs a handler and without a handler, they become a demon twink. (laughs) I've never heard that. I I haven't either. That's amazing. I sent it to my mom and she was like, help. What's a twink? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. That's amazing. (laughs) Right. We are not twinks. We are. N- I don't know if I ever was a twink. <laughs> I was too hairy, I think, to be a twink. Yeah. I was skinny enough. At I one mean, point, you've but. also have had like a full beard since like what junior year of high school. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was a. I wasn't a twink. I wasn't a bear. I wasn't an otter. I was awkward. I was just super. Yeah, you were awkwardly shaped and built, <laughs> and. But now you're a bear. I don't even think I've hit my prime yet. <laughs> Well, lucky me. At least I tell myself <laughs> that so that I can hopefully yeah. feel attractive at some that's point awful. in my life. Your peak is coming. Your peak is coming. Promise. <laughs> Promise. Um, that's really interesting. God, twinks. Yeah, bears. Anyway, the bears frequent leather often. So you'll, yeah, they just associate sometimes. But I think that there's so many subcultures of, of gay, I, that I don't even, like dog masks and shit. And well, that's a little bit of the leather, like tail vibe too. tails that go up your butt. The furries. Well, that's like furry ish, oh, furries, furry. But yeah. there's also in the leather world, there's like people who dress up as leather animals, and like it's yeah. mm-hmm. there's a lot of layers. If you're to into the, the leather, world. if you're a listener and you're into the leather um, scene, let, let us know what that totally entails because we're a little. I actually don't totally know. I know, I've, like sometimes I'll see stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. But like Folsom, Folsom Market is that what it's in San Folsom Francisco? Folsom Street Fair. Folsom Street Fair. Um, which is like I a think. 
I don't even know, but I think there's a that, it's like a, a whole lot festival, but there's a lot of like sex, sex on the Lots street, of sex. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But if you are a listener and you're into leather, let us know what that means. Yeah, give us a little, tell us a little five star review, letting little... us know what. No, that's not oh, right. that was not. Damn it. We want we're cheering. Give us Yay. a five star review. Five star review and let us know. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, One day I'll learn. One these day. <laughs> Um, all right, so 1977, Paul drinking heavily, visiting these leather bars. So this jumps us back to September 14th, 1977, which is inside Addison Verrill's Greenwich Village studio. So remember, Paul met Addison, took him, not Paul, but Addison took him back to his apartment. So 7.30 a.m., they have some romps. They have sex. <laughs> romps. After having sex. I had a ding-along, sing-along. <laughs> oh, it's... I'm apparently. Um, and then it was not a single long after. No. So after having sex, Paul, who felt that Addison was not reciprocal in either sex nor in the soul, whatever the fuck that that's, means. I mean, that's just super um, weird. Like you just met, you weirdo. Like you, you literally, you just met at the yeah. bar and you just had sex with each other. So how is that not reciprocal? Thank you. So um, all of a sudden, because of this, because he was not feeling reciprocated in sex and soul, um, he said that something just hit him. So what Addison didn't know um, was that what was supposed to be a one night stand, because that would be normal, was actually Paul wanting a lasting thing, something that would go beyond sex and perhaps into a friendship, a lover, or even marriage. Which gay marriage did not last. But wait. Also, didn't you say that you were like sometimes gay? Right. And you also just met. Like this is the yeah. first... That's so weird. This reminds me, it's reminding me of somebody that I we probably shouldn't talk about on the podcast. Oh, I don't know. There was one point Kevin thought he could be straight and be with a woman, and oh. that woman went on two dates with him. And yeah. that's she not what happened. I didn't think life. I could be straight. You I, thought you could, I thought I could date a woman because you my you ex could, was cheating on me with women. No, that's okay, why. that's a better way to put it. Thank so, you. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I knew I was never straight. <laughs> anyway, it kind of has that same vibe of like, yeah, she got super. She obsessed. fell in love and she eventually moved in with us into an apartment with the idea that she would break us up because she was still madly in love with him. Oh my god, very that's strange. Weird. But it felt very. But it's all turned into me never telling her I was gay, which is not true. <laughs> Thank you. So if you're listening um, to okay. this, I'll call you out too. I won't say your name because no, you will uh, probably figure out a way to get back at it. Oh God. Yeah, and who cares? <clears throat> Megan. Oh, Brent. <laughs> Jesus. Who gives a shit about her? I know. She's hopefully living her life and is not a virgin anymore. Okay, so <laughs> um, since he felt abandoned, we're talking about Paul. Since he felt abandoned uh, by the seemingly um, or the stranger in Addison, uh, who he had just had sex with, he decided that he had to do something he'd never done before and went into the kitchen, Addison's kitchen, grabbed a firing pan, then knocked Addison over, over the head, crushing his skull. So Paul then moseyed back into the kitchen, grabbed a knife, walked back into wherever Addison was, um, basically dying, and uh, uh, shoved a knife into his chest and then repeatedly stabbed him numerous times. <sighs> So what the actual fuck? Afterwards, Paul stole, stole, Paul stole a total of $57 in cash, a master charge card, Beryl's passport, and some of his clothes and left. So he left the scene and proceeded to buy more alcohol and just got drunk. Because that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Addison, of course, he was a reporter for Variety, worked in the, the it was a film, um, he wrote about the film industry. Uh, he was later found that day stabbed and beaten to death um, in his apartment. But like many, many murders uh, of gay men at the time, his murder received hardly any attention from the local press. So um, when they were there, they did note that there was no sign of forced entry. And they noted that there were several empty beer cans and half full liquor glasses at the scene. So they just thought, well, it's another gay dude that got murdered by somebody <laughs> he invited to his apartment. So because of the lack of coverage, um, the Village Voice journalist, Arthur Bell, called out the media's complete lack of empathy and covered uh, and coverage toward the lives of gay men. So he actually wrote, and I quote, we are all aware that there are psychopaths roaming the New York city or New York streets, and they don't advertise their attentions on their t-shirts. When they zero in on gay men, the sentiment often expressed is they brought this on themselves. He <laughs> continued each year. There are approximately four sexually oriented murders of gay men in the Greenwich village area. Seldom do the papers report the crimes. Not all of the killers are apprehended. Often witnesses are afraid to speak up because of their closet status. 
Which is so sh- just shitty. Yeah. Here's where things get a little bit interesting. Now it gets interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> September 22nd, 1977. This is eight days after the article was published by Arthur calling out the media. Arthur received a call from someone who said, I killed Addison. And he continued, look, I like your story and your writing, but I'm not a psychopath. He didn't give his name. I think the fact that you called kind of like helped support the yeah, fact like, that you are a psychopath. Wait a second. Right. Because you're worried about what somebody's <clears throat> calling you at this yeah. point. So um, he then began to tell Arthur how he met Addison at Badlands where they partied, eventually having sex, which led to the murder. So I wanted to read a little bit of the article because I think that this is really kind of an interesting um, thing. And um, the article was titled, Phone Call from a Fugitive. I Killed Addison Verrill. So like he had like a full conversation with this man. Yeah. So it's, this is by Arthur Bell. And I won't read the whole thing because it's a little bit long. But he says, <clears throat> on Thursday, September, September 22nd, eight days after the murder of Variety critic Addison Verrill, my phone rang. It was Jan Albert who commands the Voices City News Desk. Um, this nut called the office twice, claiming he killed Verrill, she said. He wants to talk to you. He said last week's front page story was wonderful, but there's a mistake. You called the murderer a psycho, and he says he isn't. This guy is very aggressive, very theatrical. He said that I'll be able to write a book titled, I Talked to a Killer. He's calling back in five minutes. Should I give him your phone number? I said, yes. (laughs) Ten minutes later, the phone rang. A clear, pleasant voice asked, is that your picture on page 23 of The Voice? No, I answered. That's Addison Verrill. It sure doesn't look like Addison Verrill. I killed Addison. Oh, then what did Addison look like? Better than that, he said. Look, I like your story and I like your writing, but I'm not a psychopath. So, uh, it continues. Who is this? I just told you. I killed Addison Verrill. I can't tell you my name. I'm gay and I needed money and I'm an alcoholic, but I was no psychopath. We talked for 20 minutes about the early morning hours of September 14th. He said he had dropped into Badlands, a gay bar on Christopher Street. He was broke and hadn't had a drink for at least three months. Addison Verrill, a stranger, offered to buy him a beer. Verrill, he said, had cocaine, um, some other drug with uh, nitrate, I don't know, and marijuana. The two snorted, sniffed, and smoked between drinks. At about 3 a.m., they left for the the mine shaft, and after hours back room bar... Uh, on Washington Street. Do you guys know what a backroom bar is? No. It, I'm assuming it's like a you enter through the back and they're open after hours. No, I, I think that a backroom bar is where they have the back room that you can have sex in. Oh, mm. well, mine shaft that would have a back room. Correct. Uh, that was on Washington Street. So there was more... Um, don't know what that word is. So several people came over to speak to Verrill. I don't, I didn't realize he was such a superstar and I wanted to go home with him. The caller said, I wanted more than unilateral sex at the shaft. So I probed Addison um, to take me to his apartment. He was reluctant because he had to get up early the next morning. He said he was working on a story. Um, it continues at 5 a.m. I was told they taxied to Verrill's 17th floor studio at 2 Horatio Street, where they drank two bottles of scotch and snorted more coke. Jesus. They had sex about 7.30. Um, when it was over... That much drugs and alcohol. How were you able to get it up? Right? I mean, that's great. It's a great question. Um, when it was over, the caller said, something hit me. Addison hadn't been reciprocal. It wasn't just the sex act it was, it itself that wasn't reciprocal. It was the soul act, too. I wanted a lasting thing, something that would go beyond sex into friendship, a lover, or marriage. I can't fathom exactly what I did. I concede that it was my alcoholism. There. Okay, blaming it on something else besides the fact that you're just a fucked up like, human being. Okay. There's a stigma placed on alcoholics, but I needed money and I hated the rejection. It was the rejection that triggered things. Something flared up in my head. I decided to do something I'd never done before. I took a heavy frying pan from the kitchen and knocked Edison out. Then I went into the drawer in the right-hand side of the kitchen, removed a knife, and stuck it into Addison's chest. I plunged it too high. I should have stuck it a bit more toward the center left. And he's just telling this to the reporter. Yeah. Following the murder, he said, he ransacked the apartment but found only $57. He took, he took Verrill's master charge card, his passport, and some of his clothes with the money. Um, with the money, he bought booze and kept himself high all day Wednesday. I later learned that he spent Wednesday night at the club baths, which you guys know what the baths are, right? 
Yeah, it's it's a bathhouse where people, gay men, go and and have sex. So, <clears throat> um, during our conversation, he asked me about myself and said that I must find my work fascinating. He said he was approximately the same age as Veril, a little shorter, thinner, and in better shape. At one time, he said I had wanted to be a dancer. <laughs> he had always been interested in the arts. And years ago, he had been in movies and TV shows. His father um, was an orchestra leader, and he, was, uh, or, and he has a wife in Berlin um, who has a very low mental... <laughs> who has a very low mentality and doesn't understand about my being gay Okay, and a 14 year old son. Okay. So my caller seemed eager to, uh, my caller seemed eager to talk. He divulged pertinent information, then stepped back as if longing to be captured, but afraid of giving himself up. What? Oh, I thought you were laughing. <laughs> no, that was weird. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> there was a kind of boastfulness and some remorse. He seemed to feel that talking um, to a reporter might make him a media star. The word atone came up several times. How was, narcissistic was this man? So the word atone came up several times. It was Yom Kippur. There was no way to atone, he said. I'd like to atone, but I don't want to give myself up. I wouldn't be able to practice again. I'd lose my license. Practice what? I can't tell you, Arthur. Then you'd know. After he hung up, I headed um, for homicide. After or where I talked with Lieutenant John, um, <clears throat> John, 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 um, Euknis. According to Euknis, the caller definitely sounded like Addison Verrill's murderer. He had given uh, me some information only the killer could have known. The master charge, for instance, and um, a white substance on the floor beside Verrill's head. My caller had mentioned some Crisco. Detectives had not been able to identify the substance. The call, um, Euknis said, was the first tangible evidence that ha- that he had on the case. He predicted that the caller was one of one ho- of the one hundred or so people who had been quizzed by the department, and that he um, would phone again. Um, elaborate preparations were made. I was given emergency numbers to call and told um, that a patrol car would pass my apartment every thirty minutes. My friend and neighbor, um, Sean Considine. Constantine, I don't know, agreed to spend the light the night at my place to calm my frazzled nerves. Oh my god, I'd, I would be freaking out right now as well. <laughs> yeah. too. Uh, by 7 p.m., I was home from homicide along with four detectives and Mary Ann Partridge, the voices editor. Uh, when they left, Sean came over. We ate Chinese uh, takeout food, drank cheap wine, listened to a tape of a Sophia Loren interview, and, uh, wa- and waited for Mr. Gay Bar. Who's Mr. Gay Bar? At 11.30, the phone rang. I'm this assuming time, they were waiting for him to come. Yeah. Um, oh, Mr. Gay Bar. That yeah. would make sense. <laughs> um, I mean, he found a man in a gay bar and killed him. Yeah. At 11.30, the phone rang. Uh, this time, another voice said, I know who killed Addison Verrill. The man identified himself. I'll call him Mitch. So Mitch was edgy. Um, rather than talk on the phone, he said he'd prefer to see me. Nevertheless, he rambled on. He claimed that he had met someone at St. Vincent's Hospital last July and that they had become friends. The man, Mitch said, was an alcoholic drying out. Mitch's description exactly matched one my earlier caller had given of himself. Mitch said his friend was an unemployed x-ray technician, uh, which might explain the comments about not being able to practice again and the anatomical knowledge um, evident in his description of the stabbing. So he phoned me the morning after the murder um, to say he'd killed Veril, Mitch said. Um, he had to share his experience with somebody. I was the only person he could relate to. Mitch had given this information to the police. Um, and so he said his best, he said his friend called him, uh, or sorry, he said his friend called himself Paul Bateson. This is another fire in the city. Or not a fire. It could be a lot of different things. It could be a lot of things. So anyway, he said his friend called himself Paul Bateson. Um, but I doubt if that's his real name. Bates or Bates' son, son of Bates, Norman Bates, was Tony Perkins' name in Psycho. Get it? I know um, that Paul used other names. Johnny Johnson is one. He told me uh, much more, and uh, he agreed to me. Or he agreed to meet me in so at a Soho bar uh, at 1230, but first I went to Homicide. It was like the big um, production number from Hello, Dolly. I was greeted by the boys and ushered into Euknis's inner sanctum. Yeah, sanctum. <laughs> My mind went to rectum. I don't know why. <laughs> um, 
He confirmed that <laughs> Mitch um, had indeed been in um, and that detectives had visited Bateson's apartment at East 12th and University Place, a block away from the Voices offices, but that Bateson hadn't been home. Um, Bateson's not been a strong suspect, you can have said. He has no arrest record. Coincidentally, though, um, there's a couple of men down uh, at his place now, which I found to be really interesting. So you can advise me to step, or you can advise me to skip my rendezvous with Mitch. Good, uh, good idea. Uh, he told an officer to bring Mitch back to headquarters, suggesting that the cop pay the bar tab. Within 15 minutes, Mitch was at homicide. They let him go a couple of hours later. Paul Bateson was brought in too. I was told that when the cops found Bate. Bateson um, at his apartment he said he knew exactly why they wanted him for killing that guy in the village Bateson made statements that duplicated the information he had given me um, the whole bit one detective said everything matches he also admitted that he phoned you and uh, he led us to Veril's missing passport and credit cards so Friday morning, I saw Paul uh, Bateson as he was taken from police headquarters to the courthouse for arraignment. His hair was short and blonde. He wore blue jeans, a gray hooded sweatshirt, and wore and work boots. He looked as if he um, and uh, and his clothes hadn't seen soap in a month. You, uh, and he seemed tense. <laughs> Yeah, he was just arrested for murder. <laughs> uh, when voice photographer Fred McDera took his picture, he screamed, "Who is this guy? Um, why are they doing this to me?" So. Uh, uh, why are they doing this to okay um, why did you kill someone yeah. uh, who is Paul Bateson the police apparently have little information other sources have told me that he was familiar he was a familiar face on Christopher Street um, and that he marched in the gay pride parade in June which is really interesting with an uh, Anita sucks sign spent most uh, Sundays at the Morton Street Pier and carried a card stating that he was an alcoholic. You guys know the Anita sucks, right? No. Sign. Um, so there was a politician shit. What was her name? Anita, Anita, la, 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 la. She, oh. was, she was trying to get... Um, uh, Anita Baker. Really, no, Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant. Yeah, she was trying to get gay... Uh, take away everyone's gay rights, basically. Which there, there weren't a lot of gay rights then, but she was really pushing this like religious narrative. Really what we're seeing today. Um, so... I've been told that in his search for something that would go beyond sex, Bateman often went to abandoned waterfront warehouses and to the baths. He was a regular at um, this other place that burned down. And uh, anyway, so he goes on to basically um, talk about Paul just a little bit and, and him in the gay community. So that was the article that, um, that Arthur um, put out. Arthur Bell, Bell Arthur. That's so put crazy. Out about this after this guy called him. After imagine Paul having called him. somebody call you and give you the account of how they murdered somebody. I know. Mm -hmm. So how terrifying would that be? Agreed. Uh, so afterwards, obviously, Arthur called the police um, and retold the story to the investigators. They believe the person calling um, in because he had included details not released to the public. So at 11 p.m. that same day, that Mitch guy called and was like, um, I know who killed um, Arthur and his name is Paul Bateson. So, um, they talked about how they, uh, Mitch had told him, like I said in the article, how they met at St. Vincent's hospital, blah, 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 blah. So police were then informed of Paul's name. So let's talk about the arrest in the trial. So police arrived at Paul's apartment where he was incredibly drunk. Um, he was arrested and charged with second degree murder, second degree murder. Um, why just second degree don't murder? Know. So Paul wasn't surprised um, when he was arrested, which again was in the article. Um, he basically said um, when the police were like, do you know why we're arresting you? He just pointed at this article, the Village Voice article, and, and indicated that that was probably why. So <laughs> um, here's what's interesting. <laughs> here's another an twist. Asshole. Here is another twist in the story. Uh, while he waited for his trial, Paul was held at Rikers. So uh, while at Rikers, he began to brag to other prisoners about other murders he had committed. I mean, because of course. So, while in prison, he said that he picked up gay men and murdered them just for fun. Then, he would chop up their bodies, putting the pieces into plastic trash bags and dumping them into the Hudson. Again, Wow, the Hudson. that's the same. Just wait. It is. But like... But like what? Was he just saying this for clout in prison? Hmm... So here we go. <laughs> and there's more. These statements caused the police to suspect Paul in something that was happening at that time that was dubbed the bag murders, which plagued the city 
between the years of 1977 and 1978. So, oh, that's cool. The Bag Murders. So this was actually a series of six total murders of six men from 1975 to 1977 that happened in New York City, specifically in the gay community. So the nickname originated from the fact that each victim had been dismembered and their remains stuffed into garbage bags and thrown into the Hudson, which apparently is like what everyone was doing in the 90s. It's a popular thing to do. Or the 70s at this point and all years, I guess. So the identities of these victims as well as their killer have never been established because the bodies were so messed up that they could not actually establish who these people were. Oh, that's so sad. Um, but the clothing that were found with the remains connected the victims to the leather stores in Greenwich Village. Ugh. So police assumed that all the victims were gay. So Yeah, and it kind of sounds like it was Paul. So during the investigation is when Paul was arrested. So Paul's case went to trial in early 1979. Um, in pretrial motions, Paul, through his attorney, tried to have his confession suppressed. He said he was drunk at the time and that police didn't read him his rights. Um, he also denied calling Arthur, claiming okay. he suppo- the, that his supposed confession was just based on what he had read about the case in The Voice. Okay, but he said things that nobody knew about the case. So, and he already He's confessed also it. like, and you, you've can't, confessed. you can't arrest me because I was drunk at I the time, trying. even though I'm always drunk because it's I'm not an my alcoholic. Fault. So yeah. and what I maybe didn't mention earlier was that when he got to the police station, he told exactly the same story that he had already told to um, the reporter. The exact same shit. So he literally had another confession. So Fucking dirtbag. Um, the state entered both his confession and the Village Voices article into evidence against him. So the prosecutor um, also called a witness to the bag murders. His name was Richard Ryan. So he claimed that Paul actually told him shortly before Addison's murder that he had also killed three other men named Ronald Cabo, Donald McNiven, and John Beardsley. John Beardsley is a really familiar name, and I'm not sure why. Look that up. I will too. <laughs> um, I meant to earlier, and I forgot. So each of these men um, had been stabbed to death in their apartments in Lower Manhattan. Um, he also alleged that Paul had admitted to killing and dismembering six gay men. Jesus. But like, if he was the bag murder, why with Addison, he would have done something different. Um, I don't know. That's a great question because these other three guys that, that he said that he killed, he left them in their apartment too. Oh, weird. Yeah. So it sounds like he had done more than just maybe. So the trial, uh, went really quick and he was convicted literally four days into the trial. So on March 5th, 1979, he was found guilty. The judge, whose name was Judge Goldman, found the connection to the bag murders to be too... What was this word again, Bren? Oh, I forgot. Um, ephemeral? Ephemeral, yeah. Ephemeral? Was that it? Um, Sorry, guys. Big words. Big words. We both, do words. we both went to art school. God, I'm a, <laughs> but yet I'm a CEO of a company. <laughs> I can't say ephemeral. Uh, anyway, he said that it was too ephemeral to merit any consideration in sentencing. Which is really interesting. So the prosecutor, what the fuck? The prosecutor <laughs> calls, call, help. The prosecutor help. called Paul no, uh, a psychopath. <laughs> I could read your voice. He was such a good voice. Anyway, <laughs> the prosecutor called Paul a psychopath and reiterated his belief that Paul was actually responsible for the six unsolved bag murders. Um, but of course, it, it did not hold. Um, but a month later, he was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison which was five years or less than the prosecutor William Hoyt had asked for again, because it was second degree. Yeah. So no charges were ever brought against Paul for the bag murders due to lack of evidence, um, which is interesting. So here's prison and release. So Paul served 20 and release. Uh huh. Okay. Paul served 24 years and three months of his sentence becoming eligible for parole in 1997. So in August of 2003, he was released. Of course, he his was. parole was successfully completed in November of 2008. He then disappeared from public record until 2012 when something popped up. What popped up was his apparent death. He is currently presumed dead as there is record of his social security number, according to the social security death index, which I didn't know that that existed, but it makes yeah, sense. Um, and it showed his full name, social and birth date stating that he died on September 15th of 2012. He was released when he was like 63, which, okay. Yeah. So he probably is dead. Um, but uh, this is interesting too. So it's uh, worth mentioning that Paul uh, was portrayed in the next Netflix series, um, 
Mindhunter. Oh, that's interesting. That yeah. was a good show. We didn't watch the last season. We didn't. Season. Yeah. So I'm like, dang. So now we need to add that back we to should. our list. Um, another quick note. Um, it is said via the Hollywood, Hollywood Reporter that that director that we talked about that directed The, the Exorcist, yeah. William, um, he visited Paul in prison and that from his conversation with him, he was inspired to direct the film Cruising, which was a thriller about a cop who goes undercover to catch a killer preying on gay men in New York City. It starred Al Pacino. Well, I mean, that's not a bad idea. I know. <laughs> so furthermore, I thought this was interesting because my mind was like, wait a second, that sounds familiar. This film was also the inspiration for James Franco's interior leather bar. I was wondering why you were asking yeah, me what which, his name was. <laughs> I couldn't remember. I'm like, what is Franco? Franco, Franco. I was uh, like, James? James? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, interior leather bar was basically a film that reimagined the lost 40 minutes from the film Cruising which was also a broader exploration of sexual and creative freedom. Um, it's an intense film. Uh, it's, yes. Uh, it premiered uh, at Sundance in 2013. It is pretty graphic. Pretty. It's very it's, graphic. It, it's it very reads sexual. It's like a porn. A porn. Um, but it was actually a really good film. Yeah. I actually really enjoyed it, uh, but it is a graphic. Yes. Like I... It's graphic. It was very intense. Yeah. And like you can see James Franco like in the background watching dudes suck each other. Like it was a lot. Yeah. But it was uh, it was actually really well done. Yeah, I thought so. Anyway, friends, man, that was the story. I of love Paul. I love that you did Jason. this one because, like I said, I was doing my research and I saw like a little bit of it, and yeah. I was like, "No, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this one instead." So I'm really glad that you did this one yeah. because like I did not read into it, and I didn't realize how messed up the story it was. Is. Funky. Well, and it, it makes me think about the the bag murders, right? And yeah, and I there's just there has to be so many unsolved murders 100%. and murderers who got who just went off that Absolutely. just never got well, yeah. caught well and it's i feel like this is a very common thing that happens in any kind of minority world yeah. Yeah. right and the, the gay minority realm is in the same in the same to some degrees and in the same light as the police at the time saw them as not worthy enough to do anything about it um and it, it just seems like this always happens. A lot of the stories we'll end up reading or going through will be talking about the police who didn't do anything because they didn't think that the person was worthy of them solving the well the crime. Because to them at the time, it was a gross, disgusting thing that people didn't understand yeah, yeah. like they still do with the trans community and the non, non-binary yeah. community. Well, just and the LGBTQ I mean, community in general, but definitely with the attack on trans. Yeah, yeah well, especially... Yeah. A, a, black trans women they mm-hmm. are they are killed at a higher degree but the police are just like eh, whatever yeah whatever yeah. well and i it think that that's why the village voice journalist arthur bell was so incredibly important because he was actively calling out yeah these um uh, the media that that would not cover uh, well, the, the media and the police in. yeah 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 essentially yeah absolutely so uh really interesting but um so one that i did not know like no, me, me I didn't know about the bag murders, but I also like had no clue yeah. about this one either. So yeah. Good stories. Yeah. Today on Forget About It. New York City Murders. Yeah. The Ding Along Sing Along episode. The Ding Along Sing Along episode. <laughs> We're gonna need to write a musical now titled Ding Along Sing Along. We will. Yeah. We'll have merch. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we should make a shirt. <laughs> should make it says Ding Along Sing Along. <laughs> um God, that, you know, why did this was happen? A, interesting episode i feel like our it new was. york episodes have been very interesting mm-hmm. we need to do more of them for sure from new york <laughs> live from new york um <laughs> it's homicide the podcast <laughs> <laughs> snl hi right um anyway yeah really interesting stuff so uh Crazy. please remember to subscribe to yes. our uh, youtube channel but certainly follow us on wherever you listen to your podcast but specifically spotify and apple uh and be sure to leave us a review five stars thank you so much only um, and that's uh, all we'll accept yeah, yeah that's it you're not and if you don't like it less. leave a five star review and tell us why love that yeah just love five that. stars all the time or don't tell us why because i don't care i know keep it to yourself thanks. <laughs> thanks um guys thanks for joining us on this adventure i know it was a good one yeah any parting um what what was i saying for a while because now i forgot any oh man i would say any um well, parting I need to words? listen. No, it wasn't parting words. It was like any something about um, objecting or I don't remember what it was. Any. Um, okay. Well, no that's idea. that. Well, so, any parting cool words. Story. 
<laughs> Rude. Any questions, comments, concerns? That is what we say Look at work. Look out for those oil <laughs> drums. Yes. Oh, yeah. Fuck oil drums. The, that is a great lesson today. Yes. Oil drums. And if you're a sex worker, don't follow people to Long Island. No. And um, be careful of narcissistic assholes who want to Or if you're a woman, no um, just be weary of men. I think yeah. that's, that's the that's. The I think message. just like, well, yeah. especially for women, but just in general, I think that's a general statement. Just be weary of men. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree. Done. I just, you Absolutely. know, here we have people's rights being taken away and men wanting to control women and their bodies. And it's a brave new world. Right. And if you don't know what that means, go fucking pick up a book. Okay. That's that. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>